and they will be posted uh, within the week uh, on YouTube. And so I'd encourage you also to check out our DRM uh, social media pages and as we're very active on there and please share them. I know there's a large group of people that are uh, interested to, in finding out more about who we are and what we do. Um, so please feel free to send uh, these resources out uh, to them. Uh, the other thing that I would um, ask you to also take a look at are some other links. So our website link, which we keep actively updated, um, as well as our uh, helpline number. Uh, and that helpline number is just for anybody out there who wants to talk to someone, a counselor. We have certified counselors available. Um, so please send these resources out to, to those people as well. And the WhatsApp link to join our group is also in the chat. So I know there's a lot of links in the chat, um, but just you know, briefly read through those. I will be posting them periodically throughout the session today as well in case you needed it to see it again. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started with tonight's session. Um, we have, uh, we have, uh, we're doing part 10 of our series on domestic violence and I'll share a little bit more about that. Um, but as you know, for this domestic violence series, we are doing a survey and attendance uh, to get the certification for you uh, because you've been regularly attending these sessions. So these two are uh, important links for tonight's session. Uh, so be, uh, please look at those in the chat window and they're just a, a Google Sheet form uh, fill for both of them so that uh, just so we know who's here and um, we can give uh, account for, for that for the certification at the end of this session. Um, so I'm going to invite um, Dr. McKellen to lead us in a word of prayer and then our guest speaker um, Dr. Letha Christie is going to just be talking like I said part 10 on domestic violence and the, the topic is the lifeboat for drowning parents uh, and what kinds of creative strategies uh, to use when facing challenges with children, custody battles, and various types of uh, dysfunctional uh, families. So uh, Dr. McKellen, please lead us in a word of prayer and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you so much, Sandy. Shall we bow down to the Lord in a word of prayer? Our dearest, loving Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise Thee for this wonderful day that You gave us uh, this evening, Father, as we come before You in one accord as members who belong to Your Kingdom Master, as children, Father, that whom You have saved us from sin and death and bought us with Your precious blood, uh, Father, that we have gathered here, Father, in di from different parts of the world, uh, only to sit by, to hear your word, to hear what you have to say for us today, and to be filled with your knowledge and wisdom, Master. Thank you, Father, for this great privilege uh, that you have given to all of us this evening. At the same time, Lord, we also thank you, Father, for our speaker today, Dr. Lata Christi. Thank you so much for her life and her commitment and the service that she is committed to, O oh Lord. And I pray, Father, that you will fill her with your Holy Spirit, that she would be able to bring in, Lord, the message that you have for us, O oh Lord, that you will use her mightily in bringing out this life that she has been so enriched with, O oh Master. She has learned to live as your child, Father, hearing your word and sharing that with every other person. I pray, Father, that as she brings in the word, that there would be a change in the heart, that there would be learning happening in our lives, Lord, that we would be filled abundantly with your Holy Spirit and be able to reform our lives and be able to be an overflowing vessel for you in our day-to-day -day lives, Master, even as we hear the topic of children, oh, Father God, as sister is going to bring this to us, I pray, Father, that it is something so precious, Lord. First of all, we are all your children, Master. And we need to know how to love you, how to live for you, and how to reflect and manifest your love in our lives, Father. And also, you have bestowed to many of us, oh, Father, children a, a big heritage that you have built for us, oh, Master. I pray, Father, that your abundant grace and mercy will be with us as we continue to have this session this evening, Lord. 
I come at each and every member who has joined this meeting. I pray, Father, in spite of so many other things, Father, they have set aside this time to hear your word, and I pray that you will bless them hundredfold, Lord, that each of them will receive something personal for themselves, Master God, this evening. Thank you, Father, for this time. Bless Sandeep as he leads through this session, of oh, Father. Bless him also, and all the desires of his heart may be fulfilled, O oh, Lord. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Thank you for coming into our Zoom meeting this evening, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in us and leading us every step of our way. Thank you, Master. We ask all these things in the most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Many surveys have pointed out that children are the biggest victims of COVID-19 pandemic lockdown with multiple side effects because it has become very stressful even for parents. Repeated exposure to gadgets, to screen exposure, agitation, changed eating, sleeping patterns for the children. Many children equate the lockdown to a prison. They are unable to meet their friends, grandparents, not able to play their favorite football game. And so they have their something anger in words and they, and they have anxiety, frustration. Some children even feel suicidal. So parents fail many times. Many of the parents whom I speak, they feel that they have failed in their approach. And you know, at this time, pair, families struggling with domestic violence and other abuses, uh, dysfunctionalities, they feel that they are almost drowning in a sea with waves, wave after wave coming against them. So that is why today this topic is, is a very important topic and has become part of the DV series. I just wanted to start this with a question. Where does the envelope for a letter without an address go? Where a ship without a rudder go? Nowhere. In the same way, without a proper guidance of a good parent, many times children lack guidance, they get into wrong hands, they develop wrong habits, and they are sometimes the potential, the unused energy within a child remains that way. It does not get used. Bible says in Psalm 127.3 that children are the heritage from the Lord and they are rewards from our God. It's very, very important for us as parents to bring them in the right way. You know, there are two ends of the spectrum with respect to a wrong parenting. On the one side, people micromanage. They take care completely. They protect the children too much. They don't allow them to participate in any other activity, any chores of the house. They have to study whole time. The other side, people neglect they give importance to their own pleasures or even their work, and they don't even bother about the red flags that can be seen in their children. So if you see the overall spectrum on one side, we see people micromanaging every activities, hovering over everything, what the child does and trying to steer the child towards the right college, right careers. They don't even allow them to play it's, it looks like a dog in a dog show. How to train a dog. It's like that way they train. They think that without them, the children can never be successful. So this sometimes allows the child to underdevelop. They can't grow because uh, once when they get out of the house, they need to stand on their own legs and at that time they fail. Because that no one is there to program their activities. No one is there to teach them. No one is there to give them the checklist, what has to be done next. And that's why they are left alone in a cold world. What is a good parenting approach? How do we do that? Should we search for a formula for parenting? I, want, I wanted to say at this time that if you search for a formula, you would pretty end up frustrated. When you read the Gospels, Jesus never healed in the same way twice. One time he spits on the floor, makes muds and put on the eyes and heals one guy. Another time he simply speaks. 
at another time he touches and once again in one more case he just kicks out a demon and that man gets healed there are no formulas with god the way god heals our wounds or works in our life is a deep personal process and it varies from person to person though parenting can vary because many times it can vary there is no right formula but there are some basic rules and if we can learn that i think we can do a better job so when i had two abortions initially i took all the medical books on gynecology to study why it happens when my dad underwent uh, um his first heart attack i took mayo clinic heart book and i was sitting and understanding why why what happens what is the reason and i think if you feel that you are failing as a parent might be you need to do a lot of research and the right way so today i have done a little amount whatever i know i am not a medical doctor but i have i can do a little bit of research so kindly hold on till the end because i am going to give a wide spectrum why it happens and it and how you can cope up so let's start so the topic is quite interesting life boat for drowning parents so here you can see in the case of parenting uh, you can see this young kid here so this child is quite young and uh, this will not have a proper maturity and even the control so i wanted to explain based on this graph maturity on the x axis and control on the y axis so control means control over one's own life that whether you can go from 0 to 100% and so you can have it all the control or you can have no control and similarly maturity it's not about what's your age it's about what stage of maturity you are in so if i have to move through this uh, thing that it might be maturity level 1 maturity level 2 maturity level 3 maturity level 4 fine like that you just move on so less mature you are you have less control if you see this graph you can easily see uh, you have a less maturity you have less control but as the maturity increases your control increases so this is the way this parent child relationship functions for example uh, in this lower side when a child is young it's a maturity level of the child is slow small and here this lower side of the graph you and your child have the control the child can have control on itself because every child control something i know which toy to play so every child has a control you cannot control some of the things what a child has a control and similarly the child's maturity level increases if you see the top of the graph that is a shared control and maturity that you are controlling if when the child is young most of the things will be under your control when the child grows grows big you are giving so how mature you are, the child is becoming the sharing of the control is becoming more so this is the way we develop for example when a child is so young the small small we can see here the control level is less and the maturity level is less this is the stage 1 in the stage 1 all the temper tram tantrums all the yelling and all the fighting and all the oppositions go on so now as you move little little more in the maturity level you go from temper tantrums to cooperation you understand that something chose you have to do you have to study in your in your home so this is some sort of maturity level so uh, if a child is doing temper tantrums at sex when it is 2 years or 3 years or 4 years it's okay but it happens the same thing when it is 16 or 17 then there is an issue so now we move from first stage to second stage and then the third stage we can come into an empathy mode from the temper tantrum mode we come into a cooperation mode then we our child is becoming empathetic on the parents and then it understand what is the family dynamics and how it can contribute then it's an interdependence parent depend on the children and the children depend on the parents so this is the way a parent child relationship grows 
so as the age grows as the stage grows it grows but now if you have a child with adhd or ocd or odd or some other mental disorders even uh, uh, when the child grows you can see that maturity level um, is less and so you will not be able to give the child control so you might be having more control on the child that's when there can be a problem so the next the second set the first one if the child has some mental imbalances the second one when you as a parent are grown in a dysfunctional family or you have some issues in yourself your maturity level will be less and that also gives rise to problem so that's when many times if you're grown up in a dysfunctional family or the third one is your family right now can be a dysfunctional family that can put both your child and you into the lower maturity level so now today we are going to see first what is a dysfunctional family and then because this is very very important dysfunctional family dynamics to understand is more important to understand how to parent because many times we fail in our parenting technique when we don't understand the dynamics of dysfunctional families so i am going to go in depth about dysfunctional family so what is a dysfunctional family a dysfunctional family if i wanted to say it gives a child very difficult childhood a family where conflict neglect and misbehavior are constant and everlasting is a dysfunctional family and where most of the people are all the time anxious and they are all the time emotionally disturbed so in a normal family people encourage one another people support one another they enjoy the fellowship of one another but in a dysfunctional family they don't feel loved they don't feel valuable they have low self esteem they have poor self image so what are the reasons for a dysfunctional family so this this is studied or about um, uh, by an american association in called that kaiser Uh, in collaboration with uh, cancer for disease control and prevention they did a decade long study it's one of the important study you go to the internet and see about this adverse childhood experiences about 17000 americans were studied based on this study so you can see here these are some of the things mainly i would uh, classify into four things addiction violent or wrong behavior divorce or death or um, personality disorder so if it is if you in your family you have an alcoholic or a drug abuser or in your family there is some recurrent physical abuse or an emotional abuse or a sexual abuse or a domestic violence is happening or some or in one only one parent is there or there is physical neglect or emotional neglect is happening to the child or one of the family member has an this is not a personality disorder like bipolar or borderline personality disorder or something like that and they are put in prison and a family member who is feeling suicidal these are some of the things in family when it happens a child gets a very difficult childhood experiences so now how they study this they took all this 10 factors now the is what they they asked 17000 people they called and they asked them to do the survey so what does the survey say see now exposure if they are exposed to only one category in one of the family person when he is doing the survey in his family there is an alcoholic so his score becomes one he does not have he is a very he is sent from a very beautiful family not everything is zero that means his a score is zero but if he is in some worst dysfunctional family his a score is 10 then he scores higher 10 so that way they score for example if there is no adverse childhood experience it is zero if it is a if it, there is one experience it's number 1 so like that 0 to 10 they graded and now based on this what they found was something shocking they never imagined that they will find it's demonstrated that these experiences have a link to chronic disease mental illness being jailed and work issues like absenteeism see you can see in this graph that as the a scores rises 
chronic depression in both men and women increases. As the A score increases, alcoholism increases. So if a child is exposed to many ch adverse childhood experience, there is a great chance that the same child will become an alcoholic when it, become, it becomes adult. So now next, suicidal. You can see how the graph when it becomes four. If you have uh, an adverse four and more adverse childhood experiences, the rate of attempting suicide is more. You are feeling that suicidal tendency because you are groomed in that atmosphere when you are young. Next, if you even drug use increases, if you have a higher score of uh, adverse childhood experience, even uh, a person can uh, experience rape because they are more prone to be raped. This is also a very shocking thing. And again, coming to um, heart disease, adverse childhood experiences, you can see here, if it is seven, eight, the heart disease rate is so high. That means stress level the child has experienced is too high. And now, if in a house, if a person has, if a child has witnessed domestic violence, you assume, so now the rate of becoming a victim again for the domestic violence, if you are a woman, it is this way. If you are a man, again, it is this way. So A score increases, the risk of being a victim of domestic violence increases. Similarly, if your A score is more, if you are a woman, you can be a perpetrating domestic violence or a man also, you can perpetrate domestic violence. You can become an abuser. So very, very important if you are doing, if you have domestic violence in your home, be careful. Look at your child. Look at that face. Why you want to turn your child into an abuser or a victim? Break that cycle. Enough of violence in the home. This is very important. See this child, this is a very true story. This is David. He's telling, I remember as a child hiding in this dark closet with my sisters and brothers unable to block out the sounds of my father beating my mother, we would cry, pray, asking God to stop. But God never did it. Now, 28 years later, I still remember the helplessness and fear. One Samuel here, once he was asking a question, he said that his father used to hit her, his mother so much and used to push her and all the children out. They have to stand out alone in the darkness and he still remembers. What are we supposed to do? It is every child's question. He, this child, David says, I see the house, the closet, I feel huddled up. My mother screams, my father yells. Deep terror, I still remember. In my dreams, I still remember. So we paid it all in our adult lives. Not one of us escaped. Some of the children became drug addicts, some became alcoholics, some ended up into violent relationship. What is sad is that I didn't realize until the end of my last abusive relationship that my kids were suffering as I did as a child. This is called intergenerational cycle of violence. If you are abused as a child, your chance to become an abuser and a victim increases. So that is very, very important. So why the effects of childhood trauma so severe? Why are we talking about it so much? Because it's like a, uh, in, when a child is very young, whatever happens, it's like a brain injury to the child. Breakthroughs in neurobiology demonstrate that fear-based childhood disrupts neurodevelopment. Because the, when you have the fear and stress, your brain does not develop. You can see here in this graph, extreme neglect, you can see the brain size. This is uh, from a journal I have presented here. So child, for, because but very, very early your brain develops so fast. Within three years, the brain development is very, very fast. When prolonged stress occurs during infancy, the stress hormone cortisol is released. The stress hormone is called cortisol. When it is released, it compromises normal brain development and the immune system, nervous system, everything it affects. 
that is why some child as are not able to grow that great and some children suffer from you know, immunosuppressant problems and this one thing is more important when the age of the child is very small for example 0 to 3 years 1 to 3 years the severity and the frequency if the abuse is happening often then again the trauma on the brain is more so if it happens once in a week it's if it happens every day and the child is experienced to trauma what will happen to the parent what will happen to the mother what will happen to the dad so this thought whether they will separate that put a lot of stress on the child making the child to develop the child development very very difficult so and when uh, domestic violence happen violence happens child is neglected they are not taking care their emotional needs are not taken care sometimes even physical needs many children coming between their parents and they are spanked mercilessly so this is very very wrong it's cruel so uh, hit you know this is uh, why i am telling is we are developing little criminals being neglected or abused as a child increases the likelihood of arrest as a juvenile by 59% as an adult criminal by 28% and for violent crime 38% so the, your statistics says that almost 36% of women in prison 14% of men in prison were abused as children so now children are the fastest growing criminal population so violence committed by youth is rising so they say that 21 and 20 babies born today will spend some of their lives in jail this is too horrible can you think about it i read the story about the violence exercised by hitler's father on hitler hitler's father's name is alois and uh, um, uh, adolf hitler's mother used to come and just lie on hitler because that man used to hit him mercilessly and she didn't know anything to deflect his blows except to lie on hitler who was lying on the floor and you know uh, this his was an exact picture of a dysfunctional family he was born innocent only to be raised as a monster he was when he was born he was not born as a monster but the destructive drive everything came inside him because of wrong parenting his one of the regular beatings he was once telling his secretary that once when his father was beating he forgot every pain and he was just trying to count 1 2 3 4 and he could count up to 32 blows he received you know in this way he learned to deny the pain and the feeling of powerlessness the feeling of despair that he felt as a child made him to mercilessly kill so many people when i went to holocaust museum in washington i was really i was taken aback i was just traumatized because i saw the bunch of hairs of women before they were dumped in the gas chambers the children were abused very badly for medical examination and later p one historian said that people could hear him screaming while he was sleeping and he used to count remembering the 32 blows he received when he was a child that's where we develop monsters because we don't take care of them in their childhood a trauma a child who faces violence ends up as an abuser as a child all mistreated children learn to repress deprive their emotions and the magnitude of the pain they suffer only as adults they have the possibility of dealing with your repressed feelings and so that is why we should even stalin his father was an alcoholic he, uh, he used to hit stalin young stalin so much so are we developing monsters like hitlers and stalins with destructive drives so next other than this this is one sort of dysfunctional other than this one next sometimes is we create dysfunction in the family by addiction if one of the member is addicted to alcohol or drug abuse or violence then the whole family suffers many times even divorce put a lot of dysfunction in the family you know divorce is not only painful but it pushes the family to some extent 
last time after that uh, la last talk of mine on um, biblical grounds for divorce one of this uh, lady who asked a question here she said that one man has reached the snap line the end of the rope um, in his marriage after waiting for a long time on her wife's refusal to have sexual intimacy in the marriage so in some of sometimes we push one person push the other one to the extent of leaving the marriage this is very very wrong marriage is very very important because in a marriage sometimes more the wife blames more the wife disrespects nags cries or else we get into problems sometimes even in marriages people give silent treatment they shut down the emotional connection with the others it's very cruel in a marriage to give to others a silent treatment is really cruel and to withhold sexual intimacy is utter selfishness and uh, some people refuse to go to counseling and this sometimes breaks the marriages and who is su suffering the young child remember that when you try to push the other person to get out of the marriage you are putting your children in a very problematic thing so this is very very important and so be if you want, if you love your child you should be very careful how you're taking care of your marriage marriage is very very important only at some cases very difficult case when a child is seeing a wrong example you are giving a example you are an example to your child if you are violent your child is becoming violent if you manipulate your child is becoming manipulated many people tell the children to tell white lies i'm not here tell the office that i'm not here in the house and that sometimes children learn to tell lies children learn to manipulate many times see in a marriage a husband is supposed to love the wife's family the wife is supposed to love the husband's family but when it doesn't happen you disrespect elders when you become a parent you are also disrespected by others so that is why your children if you want your child to respect you you learn to respect your parents and her parents so that's very very important respect love everything comes from marriage and a child sees you you are the light to the child she it the child sees its father and mother and learns from them so uh, give good examples love your wife love your husband never do silent treatment to the others never manipulate and never nag or yell at others then develop intimacy with one another this is very important not only for you if you're trying to if you are angry on your spouse and trying to do silent treatment or anything else that's one who is trust suffering is your child so if you love your children so much make your marriage straight at the earliest so this is very important and now next i would like to come to the custody battle many times this divorced uh, people when uh, after getting divorced sometimes if their child is less than 18 years the court is supposed to give custody to somebody and ha huh, two weeks it, the child can be with one person and another two weeks with the other person and uh, all these things the finally they end up you know, when when it happens it becomes a very great fight please do not put your children in the middle of the fight sometimes if the other person says um i want have this weekend instead of the next allow them do not withhold because whom you are putting in the center and don't stop child custody and uh, money whatever you the child needs because till that time they'll be having money suddenly the job they say that there is no job and all these things happens and uh, the child does not get the support the children are also asked to move out of that place that puts a tremendous pressure on the children they have to leave their grandparents they have to leave their friends and they have to leave a lot of things and so it becomes very difficult for the children you as a parent should never uh, allow the child to go through so even if, if it happens because when a real divorce happens try to pray and try to allow the child to be as it is let it let the child have freedom to choose because when we and one more thing when the child comes to you do not talk bad mouth about the ex spouse because this sometimes creates a lot of confusion 
you talk bad things about the other person and who is put into problems a child and many times a child comes and tells what happens in the other house just listen and leave it don't try to probe it many the people try to probe what are the what is the ex spouse doing what, with whom he is with whom she is and that is not of your trouble thing when god has given allowed you to come out he is the one who is going to take care of you he will take care of your child he will take care of the needs because your divorce is from god then he will take care so be at calm never worry for anything never worry for people or never worry for anything allow the child the first importance should be for the children so that is very very important so next come to i don't know what next come to dysfunctional thing what, what is the what some of the in a dysfunctional family there are some things which is very common that is they say that you should not talk to anyone we don't talk about our family problems to anyone because the child has to keep it within itself so you they are not allowed to tell even to their grandparents or to any of their teachers or their friends so they and even they are blamed if they are supposed to talk so that underlying rule is do not talk to anything so they are not allowed to acknowledge there is a problem in the family the problem gets suppressed the next is do not trust anyone so children depends on their parents to keep them safe but when the parents themselves are not able to provide a proper atmosphere to them they hit one another they fight with one another then they don't have a sense of trust and security in such a dysfunctional family as a result the children learn that they have to they can never trust anyone even their parents so even for their needs and for their safety they they fear to trust anybody so the survival mechanism gets dysfunctional for them the third one is don't feel anything repressing painful or confusing emotion is a coping strategy so in this one when they witness uh, a violence or when they witness alcoholism in a family real rarely they express their feelings so that's when they try to cope up their feelings and that sometimes this repressed feelings make the child to become an abuser or a victim later so if you have some rules in your house like don't talk to anyone don't trust anyone don't feel anything that sort of rules are underlying your family dynamics have a rethink about it have a relook about it if your parents talk to one another and the next is what are the characteristics of such a family shame shame is a pervasive in such a families it's a feeling you have and you think there is something wrong you are inferior you are unworthy so much of shame is put on the child so the child feels it's my fault if the parents gets divorce it's my fault might be i didn't try to do anything perfectionism a parent tries to put perfect you should get the first rank you should keep everything neat otherwise it's a problem so perfectionism is not only unrealistic but it is toxic to the family so the child feels incompetent worthless and inadequate constant criticism see this is very very wrong criticism is blatant when people parents are picking on something your dress is not good you are not good you are you are becoming fat and all such things it puts a lot of pressure their self image goes down be careful and many times in many of these families there is poor communication adults don't listen to one another they don't listen to the ch children and uh, many times if a parent wants wants to tell to the other one they use the child to tell that so there is a triangulation involved so you don't directly communicate you communicate to someone so growing up in such a dysfunctional family is brutal it's like an ongoing war and it leaves multiple battles cause as an adult you don't have to keep fighting the war you have to end it and while you might be having some flashbacks or something you need to understand what you are what role you were playing when you were a child so that's why i wanted to show you this important thing in a dysfunctional family this can be sick there can be six roles for example if a husband is drinking and a wife is enabling you assume so he is a dependent 
So all of them, he's the one who's make, changing the family dynamics. Everybody will look up to him when he should not be, he, his needs should be met so that he will not get angry. He will not lie on the floor. He will not, uh, he, he, if you don't give him alcohol, he might get from somewhere else and he will lie down on the a road. So all the people will be uh, fighting for that. They're trying to enable him, trying to support him. So for example, the first, so we call him must dependent. The next is enabler. She keeps the family going, taking on the protective role, doing everything necessary for that alcoholic or drug addict. So the enabler sometimes can be even the hero child or the lost child. So what is a hero? Hero can be one of the member of the family. He makes sure everything looks good outside to the outside world. So the family dynamics, the hero makes it sure that the outside world is not seen. So he takes responsibility. So he wants to achieve a lot. He'll become an, he wants to achieve all the time overwork. So if you have overwork, you might be think about in your childhood, you might have been performing the role of a hero. So your child, so you have an internal strife. So numerous extracurricular activities you might be doing. So you might be a hardworking person and extreme perfectionist. So they, that's why you might be suffering high stress level. The next is the scapegoat. The scapegoat is a person, us normally say he's a sh uh, black sheep of the um, family. Everybody blames him for everything. He gets, he gets into constant trouble. And so, for example, something is misplaced. How could you allow this to happen? Why didn't you say that so that we can would have stopped it? So everybody feels that he's responsible for all the mistakes. So this person is the one, if he's allowed to fly, he will fly away from the family without keeping in touch with anybody. Many times, if a child moved away from the family, might be think about he might have been the scapegoat in the family. The lost child, this member in a dysfunctional family, might be a quiet one. He might not, <clears throat> he, nobody will notice him. This child will not like to get involved in fights. So it goes inside its room, lock itself up and keep seeing the TV or do or read the book. So it does not want to get involved with anything. It feels lost. It feels that it never belongs to the family. Finally, the mascot. The mascot is a joker or the mischievous fellow in the family. He tries to act or uh, make everybody to laugh, to keep the family dynamics, to reduce the, uh, the stress level of the family. So he tries to suppress his feelings and tries to laugh out. So that gives a lot of tension for him. So this sort of things happens in a dysfunctional family. So are you a people pleaser? If you're feeling guilty for no fault of yours, if you are a perfectionist, if you feel responsible for others' mistakes, if you try to rescue everybody, if you have the savior complex, or if you feel often pessimistic and anxious, and if you have a poor communication skill, or you want to control others, or you are constantly criticized, might be you are part of a dysfunctional family. Think about if your family is a dysfunctional, if you are an alcoholic or somebody is having a, a mental disorder that puts everybody, others into problem. Think about now how everybody are performing. Try to do a research in your own mind because many times even whatever we experience in our childhood wouldn't have been known at that time. But when you become an adult, when you come to 25 years, 30 years in your dreams, or when you're doing your financial outbursts, when you're working on your finances, you suddenly remember all those things that you were not given any money or you are not given anything. Those sort of things come to your memory. And so that is very, very important to, for you to be healed from that one. So how do you heal yourself from a family dynamics? Deliverance from shame is the key element to recovery because you, God loves you unconditionally and there is no need to look to a human being for your need. He is going to provide all your needs. The second, you might be desperately seeking love and approval through people pleasing, trying to do what others want and allowing others to violate your boundaries, make your boundaries intact. The third, might be you realize that your motivation is selfishness. Try, you try to cope up with your inadequacy by rescuing others, by doing so much things for others. Now you understand it's for your own selfishness you do. Let's stop that. 
and you should overcome your low self image and your feeling of inadequacy by understanding that you are made in the image of god he loves you so much and no matter whatever you are told that you are not worthy of your love or anything god loves you and learn to express your feelings don't suppress your feelings and don't re must stop repeating the cycle you lived in try to break that cycle so understanding the past is very important don't suppress the past understand because it's normal you have gone through pain now you should give a safe heaven to your children so you can make a different cho choice stop blaming on your past whatever has happened everything god can change it for good so give up any unbecoming role you have played maybe you have played the hero role or the lost child or you were a scapegoat try to understand what is the reason that you are controlling your husband or your wife maybe is that something else or what, what is the reason you are having so much rage on your children something is suppressed within you today give up to god know that you cannot change people you can only change yourself and the fifth sixth one is communicate without blaming others and learn to build trust then stop manipulating be responsible for your own feelings and the toxic shame that was trying to take your power get it back from that you have power on your own life god has given you authority there is a difference between a guilt and a shame guilt says that i did something wrong i made a mistake shame says i am a mistake i am a uh, i am itself a sin i am a wrong person so that is a difference so understand whether you have the toxic shame come out of it and own and honor your emotional wounds you might have been somebody might have told you you are looking so bad or something is wrong in your life you might have had that emotional wounds within you start to see that wounds try to acknowledge it that's very very important that's what you should feel your feelings all your feelings you should and if you feel angry try to think that why i am feeling angry might be you were so much put down you were abused in your childhood feel the pain give it to god trust others you have to learn to trust god learn to put boundaries don't do whatever you were taught in your childhood let it go forgive your offenders that's why we kept a full topic on forgiveness begin to tell stories to yourself little little stories i am not what they told me i am the story god told god said i love you you are fearfully and wonderfully made i love you with an everlasting love i am not what my parent told me i am not what my friends told me that will make a difference make it repeat it again and again stories carry all the power to erect to cause events and situations to happen so that's very very important now i wanted to say tell us this childhood messages try to remove that one sometimes the childhood can give you wrong messages to you that this won't work and this child my child is always wrong because my father did this to me i'm going to do this to my child he spanked me so i'm going to spank my child it's very wrong so now coming to the first what are the best child rearing techniques don't spank your child people think that they can spank their child it is good correct your child if you want to criticize your child do it with a sandwich approach give some good something is good about the child you tell then you tell the criticism again you tell something good about the child and then like that way the child will understand something is wrong and it can correct there's a difference between correction and criticizing so don't criticize but correct your child and sometimes a uh, second one try to understand your child what's happening because many times people uh, parents don't bother what's happening to the children they don't bother to see the red flags in the ch children one child stop to talk for quite some time if it is very quiet try to find out what why it's happening you know dr mayo angelo 
you know, she is one of the great American poet, singer, and, and a civil rights activist. When she was eight years old, she suddenly stopped speaking for five long years. Can you believe she did not speak one word? She did not move her lips. And she has written this in her book, When Why the Caged Bird Sings. This is one of the groundbreaking stories she has written about her own life. When she was young, her mother's boyfriend raped her at the age of eight. When she spoke out, somebody killed him and she thought that her voice killed him. So she said, I'm not going to speak. Finally, her teacher had to help her to read a lot of books and one day God enabled her to speak. We see a lot of red flags flying around us. Our children are going in the bus or going with different people, try to find out what's happening. If you are a praying parent, God will reveal things to you. You know, when I used, when my children used to get bad companies, God correctly reveals themselves, uh, reveals it to me. And so one, three, three times I've almost caught them. So my son used to ask me, how do you know? How do you know exactly are you able to find out? That's when I used to say, you, God used to, go, God can reveal things to you correctly. He will make you to go to that place. Correctly, he will make that message to come to you. So God, God is a God who can help you to be a good parent. But watch the red flags. So the first one is don't spank your child. Don't criticize your child, but correct your child. The second one is try to have a good communication. Try to find out what is happening to your child. And the third one is look into the eyes of your child and speak. Many times people don't develop that and people don't have a good storytelling to their children. And my children used to be, when they were young, they never went to any church. But I used to read all the stories of the Bible. Really, I used to tell them. And from the small little children's Bible, I used to read out to them. Because people get carried away with stories. Now you don't tell stories. So they sit before the TV 24 by 7 and they spend their time. Their vocabulary is now so bad because they see that and they become overweight. Because all the time they are sitting in one place. They don't have healthy brain developments. So that is why you should be careful how you are bringing up your children. The fourth one, give your child love, respect, kindness. Because if you neglect your child, the brain development will not be okay later in your life. Your child will also feel neglected. And it'll not to learn the coping up skills within you, within it. And when some other child is getting abused or getting into problems, try to help them. I love parents who adopt other children who are struggling. Martin Luther King said, the greatest tragedy is the silence of good people. History will have no record that the greatest tragedy was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Many times, many children are getting abused in the next house. And we don't even bother about them. We don't even think about them. Childhood messages have unique power. When a child sees a parents are not bothered about it, parents are not bothered about their grandparents, they neglect their elders, they don't respect their elders, they learn and they in turn do that to their own parents. The fifth one, when you're angry, don't use destructive anger. There are three types of anger. Destructive anger, constructive anger, and displaced anger. What is a constructive anger? Bible says, correct your child. So that is constructive anger. So you can resolve the problem and drop it out if you cannot resolve and give it to God. Destructive anger is rage. The aggression within you that comes out on your child, the strife within you. The third one is displaced anger. You have so much uh, anger in your office or with your wife or husband and show it on your children. Poor kid. So I wanted to give you based on a dynamite illustration. You anger is like a dynamite. If you give me a lit dynamite and I throw it on somebody, then it is a 
destructive anger. When I throw it from the back, then I'm just doing that displaced anger. I'm just using it as a backstabbing. If I put the same dynamite inside my mouth, then it's a repressed anger. I'm turning the anger within me that can develop into depression and finally it can even end up suicidal. So how to deal with your anger as a parent, learn. Don't show it on the children. And finally, teach your children how to cope up. I want to tell you a little story at this time. A young woman visited her mother with her eyes brimming with tears, telling how life is difficult for her in her new place. And her mother, without even telling a word, that her mother took her hand, sat her down at the kitchen table. She then put three pots on the stove. In the first, she put a carrot, in the second, eggs, and in the third, coffee beans. And so she let them boil in the water. And then after first, she, she took all of them out and she asked her, how was it initially? She said that carrot was hard, but it became soft. Egg was soft, but it became hard. And the coffee beans started to give beautiful aroma. And the mother started to say, when your problems can make you hard and angry at the world outside, or your problem can make you soft and you can be depressed. Or the third best strategy is your problems can make you better and you, it can make you to understand others and give out to the world and live as God wants you to live. So that is the way we need to teach our children. You know, one beautiful story is about Thomas Alva Edison. When he was young, he was um, called as a mentally deficient child. He was not able to study well in the school. And one day he brought a letter to his mother and gave it to her. The mother took the letter and she started to, uh, tears started to flow from her eyes. Thomas Alva Edison asked, what happened, mom? She said, you're too intelligent and so your school cannot take care of you and I'm going to take care. So he felt happy and she started this home school and after so many years she died. After her death, Thomas Alva Edison was checking up her shelf and he found this little letter. He took the letter and in that letter, what was written, you know, your son is mentally deficient. We cannot let him attend our school anymore. Deeply moved, Edison wrote in his diary, Thomas Alva Edison, a mentally deficient child whose mother turned him into the genius of the century. You can turn your children into a genius or you can make them as nothing. God wants us to be his hands and to be his mouth. Let us use beautiful words. Don't compare your child with the next house child or with the one who gets first mark. You know, can you compare a bear and an alligator when they are fighting? If, a, if they fight in a land, bear will win. If they fight in the water, alligator will win. Might be your child is good in science or he might be good in arts. God has given each one unique capabilities. Your DNA is different. We are all made so different. And so learn to enjoy the unique capabilities of a child. What God has put inside a child, learn to enjoy the child. And it's very, very important. And sometimes we always connect a first rank with success. Success is not about how much marks you get or what's the car you drive or what's the house you have. And failure is not about what you're failing in arts or studies. How you are going from one failure to another enthusiastically, that is the way you have to treat failure. I am a scientist. If I get a lot of data points, for example, I do an experiment, I get a lot of data points. Based on that, I can finalize. The same manner, failure in your life for data points to the future. So if you are uh, thinking that your child has failed in a study, teach them that failure is not the end. And similarly, success is not the and also, failure is the start to something great achieved in your life. So teach the child to understand what's the difference between failure. Teach the child to enter into chores in your house and teach the child generosity. When you give to others, your child will see and it starts to give. Many times I've seen parents telling my child does not give even I'm old, does not give anything. 
think about it. When you were young, did you teach that to your child? So teach generosity. What you are giving to God or to poor people, let the child know. Because that's very, very important. And finally, coming to three big things before I end. If your child has some disability, people think that their child is dumb. Something is missing within them. One of our friend was telling that your child was dumb because he has OCD. When we found that he was listening, he was seeing his father's computer, which was full of dirty things. And the other one, her child was not able to, uh, it's very intelligent, but the child is not able to focus more. And it has very difficult understanding some words, some sounds, and it's not able to put all the words together and how it rhymes and uh, so then it was found that child has dyslexia. Dysgraphia is that they, they are not able to express them in writing. They are good in reading, but they cannot put it in writing. Some child uh, children are not good in numbers. They are not good in calculation. Some people are very good in calculations, but they are not good in geographically. How to go, which direction, all these things. So this is very, very important. So if your child is struggling like that, there are special educators, psychologists, and psychiatrists who can help whether they have this problem. Ever try to push the children. If they are not able to do it, if you try to push and fight with them, you are in the low control. I have shown the graph control versus maturity. So you, when the child is not able to come to the maturity level and you are trying to put a lot of control on that, you will end up in a very difficult household. So be careful what your child is undergoing. Try to find out. If your child is having attention deficit syndrome, ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, that is called ADHD, even all of us have. Sometimes my, we all, they use, my children used to tell mommy, you might be having that you are all the time uh, very active in different, different things. So, and uh, so this, even sometimes we have, uh, we try to think that we haven't switched on the gas. We haven't switched off the gas. We haven't switched off the door, closed the door. So these are all compulsive disorders. Every, every one of us will have little, but when it tries to come in the middle of the regular shows of a child, you need to be very careful. ADHD is a problem where a kid had difficult sustaining attention to some task. So if you try to help a child by giving you rewards, ADHD child, you need to change the rewards. This time you are giving it one chocolate, next time might be you might give something else. This time you're telling that a story, next time you might have to tell a different story. And similarly, the punishments also need to be different. It cannot be the same. So ADHD can be diagnosed again by a pediatrician or psychologist or neurologist. So try to find out if the child is uh, so much in that way. If it is a small amount, you, it, when it grows, it will, uh, it will change. And try to help the child by more, helping the child to concentrate more by being with them, by trying to understand what the child is good at, what the child is bad at, instead of shouting at them, instead of comparing with them. Then the third one is, first I said that it is um, dyslexia, ADHD. Then the third one is OCD. As I said, all of us have some amount of um, compulsive disorder. But when it comes, uh, becomes more and it stops our normal activities, then it becomes important. Sometimes small little children always want to have a teddy bear, a pink bear with them. That is a little amount of compulsion. But when it is scared all the time to go towards one road or something all the time, something is coming inside the mind again and again, then you need to take the child to your doctor. So it's an obsessive thought. It's an intrusive thought or an obsessive image that comes and intrude the child's child and stops the child from doing its regular activities. Next is if your child is so stubborn, what you're supposed to do? The child cannot regulate its emotions. So sometimes, as I said, the maturity control graph, it's so low and it tries to be stubborn and fight. What you're supposed to do? Take a deep breath. Don't try to fight with the child. Some of the things you have control. For example, if a child is telling it's very stubborn, I wanted to go to that place. You can tell them, honey, you can go. But I'm not going to give you permission. 
it's you are going if it's your win but any consequences you might have to face this consequence for example the giving this gadget giving this tv or giving this one is in my hand it's in my control and you might not be getting that so going is in your control so i'm not going to fight with you for that so the child is made to think what's in its control what is not in its control so what it can so the match try to increase the maturity level don't bring a child into an argument if you try bring a child into an argument it will have a sense of power you should little people can get big people to argue with them it because it gives them a sense of power and control but that's not right so do a lot of listening don't use empathy when they get into problems don't tell because i said you got it try to be empathetic with them and don't try to save them from their consequence many times we act as a savior let them get the consequence of their mistake then sit with them be empathetic with them and teach them next time let them not do it so the next one is odd odd is vindictive oppositional defiant children some people are some children are so vindictive they get into power struggle they fight they shout they yell that's called oppositional defiant children uh, disorder so this time you don't allow them to get into a power struggle when you are dealing with such a child you should be very careful you should slowly help them to move to the stage 3 and allow them their brain to regulate teach them why it is important they have to face the consequence and so these are some of the uh, things you can deal with your child but finally and i wanted to tell you separate your emotions from the discipline when you are disciplining your child don't use your anger your emotions should be separate and your discipline should be separate so it's better to take your emotions out of the discipline and uh, make your children to think let them take decision and let them face the consequences and let them be able to balance control versus maturity finally what i wanted to say is give spend more time in prayer a praying parent is a great parent you you might have gone through a lot of issues your children might have gone through a lot of issues but god the weaver is designing your life he's making an intentional design in your children he has a specific purpose he sometimes shapes them through all these things teach them that god is in control god meets them in their appointments and in their disappointments so nothing is hopeless keep them hope all the time when the world is going through a suicidal feel then uh, path you give them hope god alone can change the situation i do not know what you are struggling with it could be a broken home and a child who is so angry with you the child might have stopped talking to you don't give up god works in different ways so surrender yourself many people ask me why god should die on the cross he was bullied he was tortured we cannot comprehend that love the depths of love and depths of power cross gives us the depths of love and depths of power the same and sometimes through this child rearing parenting god takes us through the path of cross soak in god's presence soak in god's truth god invites us into his presence he transforms us it's very important you know when my second son and my first was my first son used to write 10th and 12th exams i used to take leave and all the three hours the final exams when they write i used to kneel down and ask god hold your hand i could not teach them much because at that time they were in teenage they used to we little damn and they used to all the time spend their time in football and games so i used to get scared when their final exam used to come so i can go i could only do one thing to sit and kneel down and pray you know they understood the importance of prayer finally my second son when he got into medicine in cet very good grades he attributed it to jesus christ 
my first son, he wanted to get into Carnegie Mellon in the US after his engineering. I told him he thought that every one, every path leads to God. I told him, let us pray for three months. Let's read the Bible. If you, if you get in that particular college, would you understand that Jesus gave you this college? He accepted. And we sat and prayed and we read the Bible. We spoke to one another. And finally, he got in that same college and he finished his master's from that college and he accepted Jesus Christ. So many times when we go through struggles, God is our closest support. He's our present help. Some wounds can be so deep that nobody can reach. And when you were struggling as a child, that same pain could be coming out when your parenting. Give it to God. Surrender it to the Lord. C.S. Lewis says, until you have given everything to God, you cannot shine. You cannot come out of the deepest pain. Ask him to come and meet you at the lowest thing in your life. Let us come and surrender our broken and our un unhealed places of the heart at his feet. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender, I surrender all. I surrender, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow, worldly pleasures, all forsaken take me jesus take me now i surrender all i surrender all all to thee my blessed savior i surrender all all to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender, I surrender all, oh, I surrender. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, I surrender all. Precious Father, I give this time into your hands, and Lord, whoever is listening, Father, let your hands touch them. They might have failed as a parent, but you have not failed. You will never fail. And Lord, touch them and give them assurance that there is hope. The child will come back. The child that has gone far away from the parent, far away from you. No man can touch them. No pastor can touch them, but you can touch them, Lord. Bible says everything is possible with you. It might be impossible for us, but it's possible for you. Lord, bring every lost child back. You are a God of second chance. And Lord, today, give second chance to those who are crying at your feet. Let them get their beautiful relationships back. Let the child enjoy beautiful relationship in their own family. And Father, give love in the family. Where there is silent treatment, let there be love. Where there is lack of intimacy, you bring back that intimacy. It's possible by you, Jesus. Nothing is difficult for you. Lord, why should a child face abuse? 
you love children and father protect protect those children who are right now facing abuse and lord let many many come forward to adopt children I give this time into your hands in the name of jesus i pray amen amen thank you so much uh dr latta for that wonderful talk and uh yes it is difficult but i think the only thing we uh, can do is continue to pray and and beg god uh to help us in our times of crisis and especially with and so thank you for that uh i know we went a little bit over time today but um uh tonight and i uh, thank you again everybody for uh, being here um it, you are free to leave but if you wanted to stick around and uh, had any questions uh, please feel free to either put it in the chat i've also unmuted um everyone as well um so please feel free to unmute yourself and and share any questions you may have aka this is tanuba mm -hmm. uh, my, i've got two children my elder one uh, is son he's in 12th standard Mm -hmm. and since uh, i'm separated and i'm a single parent uh, facing a lot of uh, issues and what you narrated today more or less have uh, gone through personally as well as the children also and now uh, my son is in 12th uh, boards are coming close but he is not focused uh, i need some help for him uh, he knows everything about future everything but he is not serious responsible about his life he knows what uh, problems and difficulties i am facing and there's no help and support from anywhere in spite of knowing everything he is not at all responsible about his life so can any help be provided to him what's his age uh, he is 16 and a half see he is in teenage right yes so a teenage every child will be more like that and um, maybe you need more patience what sort of help because parenting um you we can talk to the child if you are interested we have a youth counselor so can talk to them if he is ready yes. your child should be ready to talk to him yeah yeah he is a very friendly i have no he is a wonderful person and mm -hmm. he is uh, close to um, a lot also and he has got no bad habits only thing now because the online studies uh, continuously he is using phone so he gets carried away he is not doing his uh, personal studies self study and rest of the things about his career like what field he has to take where he must go how he should work uh, work about it means everything is dependent like i should do things for him so okay anyhow we'll talk to him because teenage every child has some disorder i've seen in my own life i've seen because now uh, my children never used to sit and study they all the time will be playing down so i used to get so scared but somehow god graciously made them uh, come up in life so god will do that for you keep praying and we will also uh, can counsel your son that's no problem yeah please help me out in this if it's possible thank you yes. so much it was a beautiful session i really it's an eye opening thing for me thank you so much thank you thank you